I network like crazy. Now, again, I don't network like I, you know, I have a don't be a douche rule. Like you're not going to go and be like, hey, you need to buy from me. No, here's what I have to offer. Here are the type of people I'm looking for. Tell me about what you do. Who can I refer to you to? It's that reciprocal type of relationship that you're building with a multitude of people that gets people in the doors. Because let's face it, today, everybody's a coach. Everybody's a consultant. Everybody, right? And I really had a hard time. I was like, well, I, you know, I just don't want to be in a sea of a million people. And I don't want to just be another coach. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building lasting, genuine relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and today I'm joined by Darlene Preday. Darlene is a passionate advocate for empathetic and relational sales. With her unique perspective, she encourages others to embrace this approach. As a teacher and coach, she equips business owners, coaches, and entrepreneurs with the strategies and confidence they need to effectively sell their services. Darlene believes in building strong relationships with clients, attracting the right audience, and creating exceptional customer experiences. Her innovative methods and business development have garnered remarkable success for both herself and her clients. With Darlene's guidance, sales becomes a process of conveying value with authority, all without compromising integrity. Welcome, Darlene. Thank you so much for having me, Candice. You speak my language. Yeah. (laughs) Relationships, relationships, right? So tell us your story. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah. So I've been in sales for um, most of my life. I started in retail and I've just, you know, regardless of the industry, regardless of even the position, I've always had a sales component to my work. Um, What I have found is now kind of looking back and analyzing like what has made me successful is that I really didn't listen to what other people were saying as far as how to do sales. Um, You know, there's, there's now don't get me wrong. This is a broad stroke. There's a lot of great salespeople out there and a lot of um, integrity driven sales, but there's also that cheesy fear based scarcity based, give them the, you know, give them the pain points, make them hurt type of selling that never resonated with me. And I just, again, intuitively just don't like to operate that way. Um, And it was not until fairly recently when um, I kind of put a label on it and decided to start helping entrepreneurs enable them and equip them to be able to sell their own services. You put a label on it. What do you mean by that? You know, a lot of people are saying like, what, well, what makes your selling different and what steps do you use? And like, I'm kind of a little bit of a rebel because I don't feel like there's one way for anything in life. Like, you know, there's got to be a unique approach, approach to things. Um, So I actually um, took a brand webinar with uh, an amazing brand specialist, um, Mary Maloney, um, with, and she kind of did this exercise where you were boiling down to what your two words are. Who are you? What are your two words? And um, mine, mine were um, the encur- like encourager, right? And then I'm thinking, you know, that's really how I sell. I want to encourage people to do better, to succeed. If it's the service that I'm providing, if it's a product I'm providing, would this put that person to the next level? So then it kind of boiled down to, okay, well, what does that take to get there? And that's where I came to the word empathetic, empathetic seller, right? Empathetic seller. Started telling people about that. And of course, Mary thought it was brilliant. She was like, you need to trademark that, you know, (laughs) everything like that. And, but 90% of the people that I said that to said, that sounds like an oxymoron. That sounds like it doesn't match, like empathetic selling, like that sounds weak. You need to be stronger and And if anybody knows me, I have a pretty strong personality. So I don't know anybody who would say that, that I need to be even stronger. But um, so, 
So I, I kind of backpedaled and I was like, oh, maybe it does sound weak. Maybe it does. And then it just kept resonating with me, empathetic selling. And then I started really looking at the why on how I sell um, and being able to put, as I said, put a label on it, empathetic selling and be able to see what processes I use and what I do that can translate for, to help others. So I'm, I'm hearing two things here. You broke down your brand to two words, yes, which is a concept I've never heard before. I mean, I, I you, you have your guiding word for the year. Mine's release. It's all over my wall behind me, but you know, you, you, that's not what you're saying. You're saying that you broke your personal brand down into two words. Yes. And using those two words, you developed your whole program. Pretty much. Yes. How'd, because- you, uh, how'd you do that? I mean, how did you get to those two words? Was it this so, new process or? It was. Revealing Genius is the name of the webinar. It was a seven day summit. And it's amazing to me because on day one, what you start with by the end, you have your two words, but also there's so much self-discovery in that time, because when you come to your two words, you can look back and see that thread through every single position I've ever had, personal relationships, all of those different things, or it's really who I am, Um, regardless of where I worked, what I did, this is how I operate. It's the one of those core values that um, I like to help people. I like to put I like to put myself in their position. What would I want to be told? Um, do I want to just sell what I'm selling or do I want to really help them? Um, and I've always done that. If I'm not the right solution, I have an amazing network of people who I can refer them to. Yeah. That's I love having a network to refer people to because I'm not the right person for you. I'm not the right podcast host for you. I'm not the right, not, okay. I did, I said for you, I meant for everyone. I'm not the right podcast host for everyone. Not everyone is a good guest for my show, but I have other podcast hosts that you might be a good guest for. So why shouldn't I have a broad network like that? And, you know, I, I have a very specific niche with my coaching. It's not for everybody and I don't do strategy. So of course I need to have strategy coaches in my, in my network. Um, but I want to come back to the whole empathetic thing. Cause that was point number two from the last thing we talked about <laughs> to me, selling is about a solution and you cannot provide a solution unless you are empathetic. Correct. To do it the right way. You're absolutely correct. But so many salespeople are taught to convey their way is the only way. If you don't use my system, if you don't use my service, your business is going to lack, your business is going to fail, all of those different things. And, And I can say that confidently because I have gone through sales trainings that teach you that. And And I, you know, again, being a little bit of a rebel, like I always just kind of did things my own way. Like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Yes, thank you for paying for that training. And I just went back to doing it my way. You know, people used to tell me, it's not so much anymore. It's been a while though. I haven't really been in a sales focus in a while. But people used to tell me that I was a really good salesperson. And I didn't really resonate with me because I didn't think I was good at sales. But what I was really good at is creating relationships, creating a network, having, you know, uh, opening the door to opportunities, you know, and if there is no opportunities, building the door for the opportunity. That's what I'm good at. Identifying who needs an opportunity and or who needs to know each other. And because I can do things like that, then people, when I do have something for sale, may be more inclined to purchase from me, but I'm not selling them. I'm just making sure that they have the solution that they need, which is what I'm hearing is what empathetic selling is. So if you are a person right now who's listening to this podcast for the listener and they feel the same way I do that. I, I'm not really good at sales, but they are a people person. Tell them what to do. So it, it's absolutely 100% a mindset. Because everything that you describe makes you a perfect person to be able to sell. But, and I have many clients that do the same thing. And then when they get on a quote unquote sales call, they're like a different person. They feel this pressure. They feel like they're not operating authentically. They don't know what to do. They feel like a failure if the person's not moving forward with them. And it's 1000% a mind shift. If you can have a call with a prospect, and build trust 
and a relationship, that's your win. Whether they use you now, whether they use you in six months from now, whether they never use you and they refer people, or you just had a really good conversation and you weren't the right person and you handed them off to the right person. That is your win, not a sale or not sale. And again, I don't want to give anyone the impression that this is like we can all kumbaya or whatever it is, but I still was always a top producer regardless of where I worked because I was able to operate authentically. Yeah, that's true. I have a friend, Jenny Bellinger. She's been on the show a few times. I'll link link to some episodes with her in the show notes, listeners. But she says that she has a 100% closing rate for the exact same reason. She doesn't necessarily close them on what she has to offer. She closes them on something. I need to introduce you to Darlene. I need to introduce you to Candace. And she does that. That's so she has a hundred percent closing rate because she gives the client what they need. Absolutely. And in sales, it's almost like at times when you're being a consultant, it's almost like a therapy session at times. Some Sometimes people Most of the time, people do not know exactly what they need. They know they need help. They know they're overwhelmed, but they're not sure what they need. But when you build that trust, if you're not really being honest of what, how you can help them, or if there's somebody better, like, again, you have to sleep at night, right? Like I, that quote, like you could sell ice to Eskimos. I'm pretty sure I could, pretty sure I could, but do I want to? Is that what's best for them? And it's such a fulfilling role because sales gets such a sleazy kind of title, you know, and, and I used to, so even before I d- identified all of this, I would say I'm the only per- salesperson that hates sales. Not sales, but the sales that people perceive that sleazy, that pushy, that, you know, me, 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 grab, grab, grab scarcity mindset. That's not enjoyable to me. To me, I would rather get to know that person, really know I help them. And just what your friend Jenny said, like, that's 100% close if you shift the target. Yeah. What's the win? It's about being empathetic and giving the potential client what's best for them. I want to go back to the selling the ice to the, to the Eskimos though. I don't think it's Inuit. Let's be politically correct. Inuits. Oh, oh, sorry. oh I'm not politically correct. I'm sorry. It's like, don't come at me people. I'm sorry. It is. That is an old um, idiom that's been around for a long time. So people understand it. Ice that you put in a drinking glass has to be pure. So you don't want to go out and grab snow from outside to drink. <laughs> so yeah, you may need to have ice, clean ice for drinking purposes. So yeah, it's okay to sell clean drinking ice. <laughs> well, I I think like, you know, the crux of that expression is, could you convince somebody who doesn't need something that they need your product or service or whatever? And I do feel like I I could if I wanted to, right? Yeah. But I don't want to. I want to really make sure because churning and burning clients is not a way to build a brand. Regardless of the company I work for, the service I sell, whatever it may be, I am my brand. I have to stay true to who Darlene Perday is regardless of the position. Oh, that's true to who Darlene is. I love what you just said, because there's an episode of South Park about personal branding. I uh, don't know the the season or anything. I don't know the name of the episode, but it was a a hilarious episode about personal branding that made me really think about personal branding from a different perspective. So basically they were, all the characters in the show were really concerned about their personal brand that they had been told was their personal brand. And so they didn't become, they were no longer authentic to who they were. Yeah. Being authentic to who you are is the key. It's not creating some persona. I mean, there there is some benefit. Like Beyonce, she has this persona that she plays when she's on stage. Sasha Fierce. She just becomes Sasha Fierce when she's on stage. But she's performing, right? Mm-hmm. She is performing when she is on stage. The real Beyonce is not the person you see on the stage. Uh, so that's that's one one way of looking at it. So unless you are a performer, you don't need to be creating an alter ego for your sales presence. You don't need to change the way you speak or the way you look or the way you act when you're in a sales position because the right customers are going to be attracted to you. 
because of who you are. 1000%. And that's what I find so rewarding about working one-on-one with people is I'm not telling them how to sell like me. I'm taking what they're naturally doing and just helping them be able to have more confidence to do it better. And also there's systems and processes too, that let's face it, a lot of entrepreneurs or micropreneurs don't know. And that, you know, there, so there's, there's methods, but creating it, how it's going to be authentic to them, because then you're able to replicate it over and over again, because it's natural to who you are. Back in the day, there was this marketing maven. Everybody followed her. She was like the first influencer in the marketing sphere. And she had this streak of blue in her hair. She just put this streak of blue in her hair. And the number of women that were following her who started to put blue streaks in their hair after that, it's like, you can't be her. You can only be yourself, right? Why, why are you, you know, if don't, that's not, if that's not authentic to who you really are, don't do it. Right. And that tiny blue streak in her hair was a, a small percentage of who she was. It, but people I, thought it made her stand out. But when yeah. everybody's putting the blue streaks in their hair, they all look the same. I feel like there's a Dr. Seuss book about this. <laughs> There is. I, I can't think of which one it is, but everybody tries to be, and then nobody stands out, right? And and that's you know the beauty of life is we all have different personalities, we all have different um, strengths, weaknesses, and and that's if everybody was like me. Well, I don't want to say what this world would be like. We would be, you know, we would be going from idea to idea and to idea, you know, um, but having those complementary personalities, having different giftings, appreciating when somebody is at the opposite of you, right? Like that is, that's the beauty of life. Oh yeah. You, variety and diversity are so important. If you don't have variety and diversity, it gets really boring. It gets really boring and it's really dangerous because because then you think your way is the only way. I always say, I I have been in sales over 30 years, but I could still learn from somebody brand new to sales because they have an innovative idea or a fresh perspective or some, you know, something where they don't know any better that this has been tried, but their spin on it is just slightly different. And guess what? Or timing, right? We may have tried something 50 times, but now in 2023, that is that strikes gold. How many people with ideas fail, 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 and they may not necessarily even change their idea, but all of a sudden it's the best idea because it, the timing is right. You know, I have been in the network marketing industry since I was 20, 2018, since I was 2018, since I was 18 years old. So that was way before 2018. <laughs> I started off with Tupperware and just tried a whole bunch of different things. I've really only had success with two companies, but I'm a fan of network marketing. I'm a fan of the personal development and I'm a fan of, you know, the community that it brings, but I'm not a fan of the training. Make a list of a hundred people and start calling them. Well, there's only so many times you can call the same hundred people, you know, and it's just, there's and insurance is guilty of the same thing. You become an yes. insurance agent and they tell you to make a list of 200 people. It, you cannot, it's not your people. It's not your friends and family who are going to be your customers. You have to be authentic to who you are so that you attract your, your ideal customers. Right. So Darlene dig into that one. Yeah. Well, what um, to do instead of the list of a hundred. <laughs> you know, I think that we live in a great time where everything is virtual as well. And I've been working virtually for over 10 years, but um, the virtual world opens up to new audiences, different things like that. I network like crazy. Now, again, I don't network like I, you know, I have a don't be a douche rule. Like you're not going to go and be like, Hey, you need to buy from me. No, here's what I have to offer. Here are the type of people I'm looking for. Tell me about what you do. Who can I refer to you to? It's that reciprocal type of relationship that you're building with a multitude of people that gets people in the doors, because let's face it today, everybody's a coach. Everybody's a consultant, everybody, right? And I really had a hard time. I was like, well, I, you know, I just don't want to be in a sea of a million people. And 
I don't want to just be another coach. Um, but having a good network and people that spoke truth into my life too, were like, but what you bring to the table is much different than other people. And, you know, I coach coaches. So I have mindset coaches that tell their clients how to change their mindset and they can't get past their own mindset to get into the sales realm. So, you know, it's just a matter of, again, that authenticity. What do you have to offer? Building your network, sharing your value, sharing those wins. It's so exhilarating to be able to have the right client, see them have success and use that as a storytelling about how you've seen this person transform by a little bit of help. Like I'm not the hero in the story. My client's the hero in the story. I'm there to just kind of prop them up, give them a hand up to do what they're doing and do it well. I think that's the problem a lot of coaches have is that they want to be the hero. They blast their photo all over their website, Yeah, right? I am very slowly... It's a, you know, it's slow. It's a slow process because you have to do it one page at a time to make sure everything works right. But I am very slowly taking my picture off of my website and replacing it with silhouettes because yeah. I don't want to be the hero of my story. I want my clients to be the hero. So I think it, so let, let's talk about that for a second. I think it's important to know who the best, your beloved avatar is. Who is your client? I get on so many calls and I'm like, who are your clients? Well, I can serve everybody. Okay. But yeah, no, you can't, you can't, you, you, you know, you're not going to be able to do it well. And you don't want to. And if you aim for nothing, you hit it every time, mm-hmm. right? Niche down. People are fearful and niching down or whatever. I still think, but by, by the way, my two cents, I still think you need your picture on the website. Oh, yes. You it know, has to, be, it has to right? make sense, that, but you don't need you to splatter it everywhere. Right? But, you know, who is the right client? Because bringing in the wrong client is detrimental to them. It's detrimental to you. And it doesn't make for good business. So really understanding who you can serve well, how they can benefit, that gives you more, you know, I can confidently share what I do, but not everybody listening is going to need me. I've had sales calls where I'm like, I'm not the best person for you, right? You, you, you don't need this. You probably need just to tweak that, you know? So really understanding who you can serve well, not being afraid to niche down and, and just sharing the value. And also I'm a big proponent of not gatekeeping. I'm on a ton of podcasts. I want those people who may never use me to still have that confidence. Somebody just may listen to this and have that aha moment. Like, oh, that is how I sell. And it is okay. I don't have to listen to this coach or that coach. So it's just a matter of empowering people with knowledge and confidence. Yeah. Um, saying yes to opportunity is always a good idea, even if you don't think it's a good fit. Um, I mean, you have to be careful. You do have to be a little bit careful with that, but saying yes to opportunity is always a good idea. Uh, but let's talk about the niching down because so many people think that the, that if they have too narrow of a niche, they're not going to have enough customers. My husband and I ran a custom furniture business for 20 years and our niche were antique furniture collectors who wanted king size beds because you can't find a king size bed in an antique. And so we were very on purpose with our king size bed marketing. We sold king size beds that would complement antique furniture. And we sold those beds for a very high ticket price to movie stars and Fortune 500 executives. I don't think our narrow, narrow niche was detrimental to our business and our bottom line at all. Oh my gosh. Talk about niching down. That's amazing. But also you did it well, right? Mm -hmm. So like, not only were you niched down, you were probably that go-to person regardless. And within the industry, people knew I only have a queen size, but if you really have your heart set in a king size, go to Candace. So yeah. I well, think and you can, and even antique furniture doesn't really come in a queen size bed either. Full oh. is about as big as you're going to get if you get an antique bed. But antique beds aren't like it's not like the the tables and the dressers and the and the cabinets. Beds don't last as long as the rest of the furniture does. So most people who have antiques needed to get a new bed yeah. um, or some sort of bed that complemented what they had. It's very, it was very rare to find a, find a bed that was an antique, but we never had an issue selling and we could charge whatever we wanted because we had such a good niche. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think like with service providers, like my focus is coaches, consultants, service providers, you know, but really coaches and consultants is what I focused on. But I've also served people that are web designers or they have marketing companies or whatever, and they still have the same struggles. So what I'm saying is resonating with them. If I have that discovery call, just because you're a coach does not mean you're my perfect client. Just because you're not a coach does not mean I can't serve you well, but you have to have the your value come across where it resonates with people and they can hear that and see themselves in who you're serving. Yeah. And people ask me all the time because my niche for my coaching business is solopreneurs who procrastinate. People ask me all the time, well, do you only work with solopreneurs? No, but yeah. you know, that's who that's who I attract the most of. I'm sorry, it's I got a bug. <laughs> Solopreneurs who procrastinate is a pretty huge market. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you still get the, do you work with other people? Just not only solopreneurs. <laughs> yeah, well, and there's so many different kinds of procrastination too. I mean, this causes of procrastination are tenfold. You, you, everybody has a reason why they're procrastinating and it's usually a good reason for them. Sometimes not though. Yeah. It's just figuring it out and, and overcoming it. Absolutely. And I find that too, like whenever something is in your drudgery zone, you're going to procrastinate with it. Um, I, I have two modes. Either I rip the bandaid off and bust through all the things that are in my drudgery zone. I have to hyper-focus and just muddle through it or it will sit there forever. So it's like two speeds on or off. That's it. Yeah. Well, the trick for that is put a deadline on it. Yeah. Yes. And like I have ADHD and I'm like, if I don't have a deadline, forget it. You know, I have this um, plug in on Chrome called Marinara. Do you know what the Pomodoro technique is? Yes. So uh, yes, I do. And a friend recommended it to me and I can't do it. It doesn't work for me. Marinara, the Marinara doesn't work for you? No. And listen, I'm Italian. It should. <laughs> um, it, like, <laughs> it speaks to my heart in so many ways, but it annoys me and I, I can't, I can't do it. Okay. So listener, if you're curious, what the Marinara plugin does is it sets a timer for 25 minutes. And when the 25 minutes is your for you to work, you're working and focusing for 25 minutes and then the timer goes off and you hit okay. And then you go do something else for five minutes. And when the timer goes off again, you come back to your desk and you get back to work. And then after four of those little Pomodoros, so four work sessions or 25 minutes, you can take a longer break. You can go for a walk or something. So uh, it works for me. I get a lot done when I'm Pomodoro, when I'm marinating, but it doesn't work for Darlene. So it's worth trying. Yes. Worth trying. Uh, I don't know. Again, I, I have that rebel personality. Like I like to create my own deadlines and stuff. I have tried it and I've heard great things and, and I'm probably an anomaly. So it's not like I'm saying it's not a good technique because I know many people that do use it and they love it. Just for me, it it's kind of stressed me out. I didn't like it. <laughs> when I do hyper-focus, I like to hyper-focus for like a long time, like a really long time and not be interrupted. So I think with me, I can't sit still for that long without my body hurting. So after 25 minutes, I get up and I move and then I can come back and focus again. So I think it just... It, you have to try a lot of different things to figure out what works. If you don't try new things, how do you know if they work? Like if you've never tried Indian food, how do you know you hate curry? Yes, 1000%. And and there's great apps, there's great there's great technology out there. What I like too is when I have a physical to-do list or like I have to hit these three things today and I usually put the things that or in my drudgery zone on there, when I see it, it's a physical reminder, but there's, there is a psychological thing about writing that it seals it in your brain as well. So whatever works for you, just because yeah. there's technology is great. Old school is great. Just what you said, whatever works for you is calendar. Yeah. My calendar is what works for me. It's oh, me gotta too. be on my calendar. Yes. You're 1000%. But a lot of times I find leaders, they put they may put things on their calendar. They're not going to miss a meeting, but then they have another 40 hours worth of work that's nowhere on their calendar. So time blocking, um, you know, making sure you get everything on your calendar as far as the deep work and, and whatever it may be. And even like that free time, 
that you need that headspace, get it on the calendar. Cause if it's on the calendar and your calendar will run you for sure. Yeah. Well, so I have on my calendar that I'm supposed to exercise every day and do I know, but it's there. And when I see it, it makes me feel guilty that I didn't do it. So maybe as, as if I feel guilty long enough, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, you know it, 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 but it's a, you, you're training yourself, right? And it's, yeah. you're just training yourself. Um, so let's talk about this, how, Okay. So sales is a conversation, right? Selling is what happens after you're done marketing. So let's talk about, about um, empathetic marketing. How can we start the process so that when we get to the sales conversation, it can stay in that empathetic zone? Yeah. So I think, I think it's very intertwined marketing and sales, like in bigger companies, there's very much of a divide, but that doesn't mean it's right. Um, because if you're, if you're selling, right, you're marketing, marketing is selling, it's all back and forth. I think it goes back to identifying who you can serve, how you can serve them well, conveying value to me, every single touch point for a client, whether it's before they're a client, after they're a client should give some value to them. So I love the marketing aspect of it, where you are giving value to the listener, the reader, or whatever it may be, whether they're ever going to be a client or not, right? You're helping them at some point. That starts to establish trust and it starts to establish your value. So by the time you do get to that sales call, they are already come prepped, right? They know what you could do, who you could serve, how you can help, all of those different things. So I really feel like it's very much intertwined. Yeah. And that being authentic when you, wherever you show up, whenever you show up means that the people who are going to give you the referrals are going to send you the right kind of referrals. If you're not, this is something, a, a conversation, because I network a lot. And if somebody says to me, I'm not getting any referrals, the first thing I say is, well, what are you doing to repel all those referrals that you're not getting? Like you're doing something. So people don't want to give you the referral. So why, why do you think that is? Yeah. And part of my process is I help people build out a referral program because when it is established, it's easy to replicate and make sure you're not missing it. It's not just when you feel like getting referrals or when you feel like reaching out to a network or whatever, there's consistency is the key. So going to your current satisfied clients those are your best referrals. Those are your evangelists. If you serve them well, they want to share what you do. Um, but then also the outside network of being, you probably don't have clarity, right? How many times have you been on a networking call, Candice, where somebody is sharing what they do and you're like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Like, I can't even wrap my brain around it, let alone then go to tell somebody else to go send them there. So it usually don't overcomplicate it. Come up with a simple, effective way to convey what you do and who is a good referral for you because everybody is busy. So the people that I like to refer to are people that I know serve well. I know what they do. And I know how they can serve and who they're looking for. Make it easy for your connections to be able to refer you. Okay. So you said to create a referral system. Yeah. What, is that, what does that look like? Again, everything is unique to the, the person. Um, like I, for the most part with service providers, I say establish a referral program with your current clients. Like if you know, hey, like this is how I served you well. If you know another entrepreneur that is struggling with X, Y, and Z, I'd love an introduction. If they sign on, you get this referral fee or a credit of something, or you know what I mean? Establish it, do it consistently. Reach out to those people, not to be annoying. You're not gonna reach out to them every month, but, you know, as you reach out to them for something else or a newsletter or whatever, rem reminder, we have this great referral program. We love to help others, you know, um, that type of thing, because first and foremost, when you're working with somebody, it's easy to be on their mind. And then they're, they can refer a lot of people. And then six months, a year go by and they, they just forget, right? So like you want to, again, Keep that relationship going, even if you're still not serving them, 
because chances are they know other people that, and that that's your best referrals from happy clients are like, that's like gold on a plate yeah. because I'm already prepped. They know how you could serve. Somebody else told them how wonderful they were, you know, all of those different things. So that's an, that is an easy connection and an easy sell. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is maybe, you know, give referrals back. Like if you want to earn a referral, give a referral. Yes. What a 1000%. If it's authentic, right? Yeah. Like if it's authentic, again, I don't refer to everybody. I have a huge network. I refer to the people that I know I've sent referrals to before um, and that they were helped. There's one person in particular, I send people to him all the time. I don't necessarily think I've gotten a referral to him, but I know he serves the client super well for what he does. And that's more important than to just be like, okay, I have to wait for a referral. But that reciprocity is is important too. Well, and they come from the people they're supposed to come from, right? So I have this thing. I, I love to do speed networking. I try not to go to speed networking all the time because you can become too inundated with it. But I love speed networking because you meet somebody you've never met before. And when I go to speed networking, it's usually you get six minutes in a room with someone you've never met before, right? So, and you're supposed to talk three minutes and they talk three minutes or vice versa. So I go with the intention of finding out everything I possibly can about the other person so that I can give them a referral when the, when the event is over, or that I can introduce them to somebody when the event is over or somebody, somebody needs to, you know, or introduce them to somebody else. And so I don't ever talk about myself. I just ask a lot of questions and it makes them interested in who I am because they're like, okay, well, this woman spent her whole time asking about me, but who is she? Why is she here? What's with the pink wig, you know, <laughs> you know, and the, so they inevitably want to follow up with me and, and have a, have a longer conversation later where they can actually learn more because you can't really learn a lot in six minutes, but no, no, you can't. But like, so I, you know, I have a funny story because like I'm married 32 years, so we didn't have internet dating or anything like that. So I haven't dated in, you know, whatever, 30 something years. Um, and I went to a speed networking event. I was in a full sweat by the end. I was like, thank God I never had to do a speed dating thing because I'm like, if I'm this worked up over like, and you know, I'm right. Was it in person? Was speed networking in person? It wasn't. It was on Uh, Zoom. So it was like going fast. And I was like taking down names. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that type of thing. But it was, it was really fun. But it is, you know, it's addicting. But I think it's important to ask the questions and I'm sure you being a host makes a big difference too, because you're naturally curious about other people given what you do. I'm sure that you have heard about the study that was done on the airplane where someone would sit next to someone on an airplane and just spend the whole time asking questions. And then after the flight was over, they would get off the plane and a person would come and take a survey and ask the person that was sitting next to the person asking all the questions, what they thought about the person they were sitting next to. And they inevitably, the answer would be, wow, that was the most interesting person I've ever met, but they didn't know anything about the person because they did all the talk. You know, they did all, you know, have you heard that story? I have not heard that. That I, <laughs> That's fascinating to me. I'm going to have to go look that up. Yeah. I, um, I have heard, known about this story for so long. I don't know the source, Yeah, but I always think about it when I'm in these situations, I want to be the most interesting person in the room. And the most interesting person in the room isn't the one who's going, look at you. It's the yeah. one saying, Hey, tell me about yourself. And I, and I think people are fascinating. Like I genuinely enjoy getting to know what people do. And, and there's so many different, what amazes me is there's so many different services out there and, and different takes on things. And, and people are so creative and innovative and I just love it. And I feel like I learned so much more. Um, And I have like a little notepad and this is just what I do. Like all the time I talk to so many people, I write, like I have a rabbit hole notepad. So if I'm talking to you now, one of my rabbit holes will be that story of the plane, right? Because that fascinates me. So then I go look this stuff up. Yeah. I'm going to have to look it up too. Cause it's been a long time. I don't know the source. Oh, that's so fascinating. That's so fascinating, but that's how we learn. And that's how we get better is by connecting with other people and being able to understand their stories and stuff like that. But people like to talk about themselves. They mm-hmm. love about themselves, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
I have, I have gone through, and the, the, the reason why I know people like to talk about themselves is because I have gone through an entire hour of speed networking and not a single person that I networked with that day asked me about myself. Cause I was, they, you know, I just, they never turned around and said, well, tell me about you. Not a single one did. They were perfectly content talking about themselves. Yeah, as well, long as I asked them. I, I don't know. I think that that's kind of rude. You know, um, I think like to be aware, we all get excited about what we do and different things like that. But I do, you know, I think it's to be self-aware and be like, okay, Candace, you ask great questions. Tell me, what do you do? How do yeah. you know how to ask those questions? You know, that type of stuff. That's the perfect question to ask me. If somebody were to say, how come you're so good at asking questions? Yeah. I'm going to tell them spend three minutes telling you about my podcast exactly and the groovy people I've interviewed and how long I've been doing it and, and you know everything I know about podcasting I'm going to be completely and that's not even that's not even the category that I have in my in my networking organization the podcast is what I do for fun yeah, yeah no it's very I would imagine it's very fulfilling I love going on podcasts because I've met the most incredible hosts that, you know, and, and really need people that do it as a side type of thing. And it's great. I had a podcast guest very recently asked me if I knew anybody who could develop an app using AI. And I just had to go through my list of previous guests. Oh yeah. I interviewed a guy two years ago. Let me, let me connect with you, connect you with him. Yeah. 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 And that's so gratifying. And like back to the sales piece of it, it is very gratifying to be able to get someone that needs support, you're not the right support, but get them into the hands of somebody that can really help them. Again, that builds your trust. You become that go-to type of person. You know, I'm from New Jersey. I joke, like, I know a guy, I know a guy for everything. Like oh, I yeah. know a guy, you know, yeah. um, it, it doesn't matter what it is, or I, I can find them, you yeah. know. Somebody asked me the other day, I was, it was a real estate agent in an area that I don't live in. And, and he said, well, I could find you a real estate agent, no matter where you need to go. And I was like, I don't think there's very many places in this country where I don't know a real estate agent. <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. You know? So yeah, that's one thing I don't need help with. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, some, some, some networks are tight. And when you know a handful of people in a net, in an in, in industry, you tend to meet other people in that industry because you meet each other through each other. Right. Yeah. So my real estate network is strong. Y'all it's strong. <laughs> All right. We need to start thinking about wrapping up. So let's talk about your favorite marketing tool tip or technique. Um, I, you know, I marketing for me again, back to brand sharing knowledge, helping people. I love to give value, give people tips, tricks, um, that's why I do, I do a lot of podcasts. I want people to know who I am. I want people to, when they think about empathetic sales or sales, doing things differently, that my name will come to mind eventually. So I love just, you know, when people share who they are and are able to share value without expecting a return on it. Yeah. Because the law of reciprocity, the more you give, the more you get, but you don't, necessarily get it back from who you give it to right in a different way right but like that that again i think is so exciting like it is it is really very rewarding when those things come back to you in a different way or whatever that may be when you are really operating with a generous mindset it definitely there it you reap so many rewards that you can never even pinpoint oh yeah oh yeah exactly the more generous you are, the more you more resources. The more generous you are, the more resources you have with which to be generous, right? The more gratitude that you express, the more you find to express gratitude for. Yes, the it more, is beautiful. Yeah. The more empathy you express, the more you find to be empathetic about. You know, it's uh, it just keeps going. I, I love this whole concept of empathetic selling because it's basically what I've been doing my entire life. I just yeah. didn't know it. You, you, you put the label on it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And again, it, it it's unique to everybody. You just because there's no one way to be empathetic, right? You have your own personality that you're bringing into it. You're being authentic to who you are and that's natural for you. And even if it's not natural, you can, you can learn the concepts and, and practice the tools of 
really looking at sales differently. It just because you've not have not done it that way doesn't mean you can't do it that way. Well, okay, so let's let's just let's figure that out, right? Just because you haven't done it before doesn't mean you can't do it. Somebody's thinking about that right now going, "Well, how?" Because it is it's for for you and I it's intuitive. Yes. But I find a lot of people may have had that inkling, but they've been so deprogrammed to follow their gut instincts or not. They don't have the confidence to operate where they their gut is telling them their intuition is telling them, okay, operate this way or whatever. No, I took this course. I paid five thousand dollars for this top sales guy and went through all his courses. I have to do it this way. And most people just need permission not to have to do it that way. Um, You know, one of my clients, she was like, well, I was told like, you have to get a commitment, a verbal commitment before you sign. And, you know, before you get off that call, you have to have a verbal commitment. And I'm like, would you want to do that? If you needed to think about something, would she was like, no, I feel like a jerk doing it. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it then. And also, I think you need to spend a little bit more time figuring something out before you here's an example. So my husband and I paid some, uh, you know, adults, whatever. We went to one of those big ticket events where there are a whole bunch of professional speakers. It was an arena and the the, the speakers were amazing. Zig Ziglar was there. I mean, it was, it was oh, a big wow. event. Right. And we had p- particularly gone because we were both fans of this one particular person. I'm not going to call him out. Um, but halfway through his speech, we looked at each other and said, are you ready to leave? Yeah, I'm ready to leave. And we both became disinf- you know, we we no longer were fans of that guy after hearing him speak, right? So before you spend the five thousand dollars or the ten thousand dollars on these sales trainings, you really need to find out if it resonates with you. That's a great point. Now, information, there's so much information on the internet. There's YouTube clips, there's videos or whatever. Do your due diligence. Yeah. Um it, you know, it doesn't and make sure when you are signing up that you know what you're signing up for, or if you're signing on with a coach or consultant, if they're not having an in-depth discovery call to see if you're the right person for them, they're the right person for you, run, period, run, because they're, that's not going to work. Sales is such an emotional, an emotional experience that if you are not operating authentically and you're just trying to fit into somebody else's mold, I had calls. I met someone who is a relational sales person and, and trainer on a networking call. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, we're talking the same language. Like, let's, you know, let's speak. And he was much further in his coaching career than I was by like, you know, years and he invited me to this mastermind. It was a big sales pitch. And I felt like an idiot afterwards because I should, and I felt like almost like trick, like really, yeah. but you're saying this is what you're doing. You're building relationships. And the only reason why you invited me there is because you wanted to pitch me on something. Know the room. Yeah. Yeah. And understand what people are expecting when they think about mastermind. Exactly. and. You know, again, don't be in switch. Don't be inauthentic. If you don't care about somebody, don't pretend you do. Yeah. Because the worst thing in the world, and we've all had this, is somebody who is all in, all invested in who you are. And then when you don't buy from them, it's like the switch flips and they're gone. Like, that's like, you're like, wait a minute. Now, even if I ever needed their services in the future, I'm done with them because that just shows who they are. When somebody shows you who they are, believe them, right? Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes the, the relationship takes years before it turns into a, a monetary relationship, right? Oh my goodness. I just got a text last week from a woman I've spoke to for four years. She texted me. I've watched her grandbabies be born. She sends me a recent picture and now she's going to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. She gets now she trusts you. But if she never yeah. did, like the timing was never right. But if she never did, I still want to see her grandchildren. Yeah. I still want to hear from her. Yeah. I still want to see her win. Yeah. Well, and I have one of those um personalities, I guess is the personality is the right word. Um, 
people always say, I feel like, you know, we haven't seen each other in 10 years, but I feel like it was just yesterday that we were, you know, that we just picked up, picked up where we left off. And so for me, time doesn't matter. Yeah. Our relationship, you know, if you and I speak to each other again, five years from now, we'll just pick up where we left off because that's, that's the way my brain works. Not everybody's brain works the same way. So I, even if I don't talk to you for five years, it doesn't mean I don't, don't care about you. It just means the conversation wasn't there. Right. And it, it, pe- people have different personality types, right? People have different personality types. And, and that's really important to remember. All right. This is your moment. Of, oh, do you have anything else you want to add before we move on? I think we're good. All right. We covered a lot here. We did. We did. I'm, I, I'm fired. I always get fired up after I have a conversation where I'm like, I agree 125%. <laughs> Everything Darlene said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So this is your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Um, I am grateful for, I'm grateful for my family. Um, We, we went through a rough couple of years, two years ago and my husband's health and different things like that. And there's a beauty in the hard. There's a beauty in going through a lot because then it puts a whole new perspective and Gratitude is easy to grasp when you almost lost it all. And then you can celebrate those little wins. You can celebrate the mundane. Mundane is beautiful. When you go through crisis, mundane is beautiful. So I am just so grateful for my family and that God has provided everything we've needed through the really hard times. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building lasting, genuine relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Make sure to visit gratitudegeek.com for the show notes where you can find links to all the groovy resources we've mentioned, including ways to connect with our guest, Darlene Preday. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Audible, iTunes, Good Pods, or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. I know we can make it easier than they can. We can make it better.